Carolyn Doobie here. What's the play for today? Well, today we're diving into stamp carving. Now, perhaps you've seen those incredibly intricate, detailed, small hand carved stamps. And that's not what this video is about. We're not doing that for two reasons. One, I don't have that kind of patience. And two, I don't have that kind of eye hand coordination. But I still love to carve stamps. I just like to do big ones. We're gonna do a great big one here. I'm gonna use one of these carvable pieces of rubber and it's gonna use a large chunk of that. You're gonna see the process for how to do it as well as how to stamp it because when you make a stamp that big, how do you stamp it so you get a strong, colorful, bold image with it? I've got that for you in the video too at the end. And yes, indeed, over on the blog at a colorfuljourney.com, I've got the full supply list and I'll have the link down below for you too. First thing you want to do is choose your image, and I picked this one, a Greek temple that I drew a while ago, and then I made a copy of it. Notice that it's the reverse, it's the mirror image. You want to do that when you're stamping because, well, what you carve in that stamp, what actually gets stamped, will be the reverse of that. So the easy way around that is to have a copier or your computer flip it around for you. The other reason why I ran it through the copier and didn't use the original is because the original was on chipboard. So it's nice and heavy and I can't use it for tracing. So that's another reason why I use the copier. Now you might be thinking, Carolyn, just skip the copier altogether and just draw it again right there on the rubber. You absolutely can do that. Every time I've tried to do that, I always overthink it because I'm trying to duplicate something that I have. I get really frustrated. So what I found for me is if I draw it somewhere without any pressure, copy it, then carve it, I'm much, much happier. But if drawing right onto the rubber brings you joy, rock on. It just stresses me out way too much. I'm gonna tape it down here to the piece of rubber. I'm just using any old piece of tape. And then I'm gonna put tracing paper between the paper and the rubber. Kind of like the way carbon paper used to be used when you were buying something and they'd want a copy of it. And I'm going to simply take something with a pointy end and I'm going to trace over any lines that I want and wherever I draw that's going to be transferred onto the rubber. Now this is a piece of graphite and it's the fancy way of doing it or one could say the impatient way of doing it. Another way you can do that is just rub a pencil all over the back of the image that you want to use and you can do the same kind of thing because then the pencil rubbing that you've done will transfer whatever lines you've got. Now I'm using an embossing tool here. Could you use a pencil? Yes. Could you use a ballpoint pen? Yes. Could you use a bamboo skewer? Yes. You can use anything that you've got because all you need to do is get some pressure on there to transfer those lines onto the rubber. Now the image that I used is not a carefully drawn image and I'm not carefully tracing over stuff. This is very, very loosely that I'm going over it because it's gonna give me the guidelines, the sizing, that kind of stuff. And yep, you can pick it up and check it and see if you've got all the lines. If you've got something that you think you've missed, you can then trace over it again. But I think I'm pretty good here, so I'm ready to bring in the Sharpie marker. And what I'm gonna do is trace over my lines. I'm using a Sharpie marker because that's gonna tell me what not to cut. Anywhere that I've got one of those lines, I am gonna keep the rubber and I'm gonna carve the other stuff away. As I'm doing this, you might notice that I'm not following the lines that I traced exactly. And the reason for that is it's hard for me to do anything exactly the same twice. I start to get other ideas. I wanna make little changes here and there. And some of them will be for the better, and some of them not so much. But one thing that I do know is if there's an area that I want to be sure that I do not carve, I wanna make sure that it's clearly black. That's why I'm coloring in the columns there because I wanna make sure that I remember not to carve on the middle of those because with all those lines, it can actually get visually confusing when you're sitting there carving. So I have to make it really easy for me to make sure I know where I'm gonna carve and where I'm not going to. And that corner where the two sides meet, yeah, we're gonna be talking about that thing again because that's where some of my changes maybe weren't the best choice. But we have an oops or two coming, so not gonna be a problem. A lot more is gonna happen to that corner. It's time to start carving. And I'm gonna be using these tools from Speedball. They're stamp carving tools, and they have different ends on them. You can actually store them, well, not in that one, I guess I put them all in the other one. But you can store all the different size tips in there. And guess what? For all the choices that I have, these are the two that I always stick with. A big one and a little one one that can get a lot of territory quickly, and one that can get in for the fine details. 
So what you basically do is take the end of it and put it into the rubber and then just move it along and it cuts through the rubber. If you want a straight line, you probably want to do it in one motion like I did with this one. I'm going to come along the top and you'll notice how I'm carving away from me and it's just one beautiful fluid motion. Those give me the lines that I love the most. Plus they're the easiest for me to do, so that helps for why I love them so much. Since I am patience challenged, and I know this about myself, I know that I would like to blink my eye and just have it done, I start with the larger tool for that reason too. Because I can carve out more stuff faster with this one. Now that probably isn't going to surprise you, because the larger tool can carve up more stamp than the smaller tool can do. But here's the thing, when you're using a larger tool, you can only do the larger areas. The bigger tools, I don't have any success getting them into the little areas. That's why I've actually got the little tool over there. That way I can get in for that detail work. Now this part's all going just as expected. It's going beautifully, but let's jump to the part where it's not going quite so well. It's this corner. I really don't like how that column looks on the corner. I don't like how some things are spaced. So as I'm carving, I'm basically editing the design. But here's the deal. There's no undo and there's no do over with this. So once something gets carved into like what I just did right there, there are no take backs on that. That line is now a part of the design. Now as much as that line feels like a big old mistake, I know in my heart it's an oops, an outstanding opportunity presenting suddenly. I'm not exactly sure what the opportunity is in it. I'm not sure how it's all gonna come together, but I do trust that it will in the end. I'm bringing in the Sharpie marker again to color over the parts that are sticking up, the new parts that I've put in the design so I can see what they look like. And you know what? It's not quite as bad as what I thought. Well, let's go in for some surgical cutting, some very careful, precise, small little lines here. To do that, yep, it's the smaller tool in my hand because guess what? <laughs> smaller tools are easier to maneuver in smaller places. And so I'm just going carving into it, making sure that I'm not touching, not touching, staying away from the black lines because even the slightest little nick into that black line will show up in the final design. To give myself the best chance of having control over this tool and having it go just where I want it to go, I'm going to use it in just one motion. This pushing it away from me is most comfortable for me and I have the most control. So that's what I'm gonna keep doing over and over again. I've just done the lines going up and down. To do the other side, what I need to do is simply turn the stamp. So when you're stamp carving, don't be shy. Turn that stamp all around so that your hand is in its most comfortable and most steady position. Now does that mean you wanna hold your tool exactly the way that I am? No. You need to find what works best for your hand. For me, this is where I have the most control. It might be a different position for you, but no matter which one it is, you want to make sure that you use that anytime you're doing the stamp carving if you want to have the most control over where that's going. I know the stamp isn't finished being carving. There are lots of little areas that I need to clean up, but in order to see those, to know exactly where they are, it helps if I stamp it. So I'm just putting an ink pad on there, I'm going to put the paper on it, and I'm going to take the image. By the way, why the paper on the stamp? Just because this is such a large stamp. So in general, I'm really liking how it looks, but there's plenty of areas that need to be cleaned up, especially right on that front of it with those columns up around the top, the ceiling, that really needs to be cleaned up. So I'm just going to bring in the tools again and start working around and removing any of those unwanted areas. So when I'm working on the areas that are smaller, I've really got to pay attention to what I'm doing. And what I found is my eyes have aged, just like all of me, and so I've actually taken my glasses off and I have to get my face right in there so I can see exactly what I'm doing on these smaller areas. When you're ready, you ink it up again, you stamp it once more, and you see if there are any areas that you missed. And I can tell already there are a couple little spots that I've missed, but you just keep going through this process. Ink it up, stamp it, and then clean up any areas that you want until you're completely happy with how your stamp looks. I've got the design the way I want it, now I'm gonna cut off the excess. You can use scissors and go right around stuff, or you can use a craft knife. There's no right or wrong way to do this. You just need to get that stuff off of there. Whatever's most comfortable for you, that's the stuff you want to use. 
With this being such a large stamp, I find that ink pads are not my favorite way to actually use the stamp. I prefer to use them with paint. To make it easy to use a stamp with paint, I bring in the gel plate. That's going to act as my ink pad for this, and it's also going to give me a really awesome print in the end that I can only get because I'm using the gel plate. The paint that I'm using is a heavy body paint. What that means is it's basically thicker, and so that when I'm putting the stamp in it, it will hold the detail of the stamp, as opposed to if I had a very fluid paint, then it might not hold quite as much of the detail of the stamp. So I've got the paint all on there, and then I'm going to pop my stamp on. Little word of advice for you here, if you want to get the entire stamp covered in paint, put the entire stamp on the painted area. Kind of missed a little bit there, but guess what? I'm just going to pick it up and plop it back down and make sure I've got everything inked up. Over here on the side, I have got a mixed media piece that I'm working on that's got some collage, some layers on there, and so I'm just going to put the stamp right on top of it. Once I've got it where I want it, then I'm going to make sure that it's pushed down everywhere, that I've got good contact between the stamp and the piece of art because, well, if those don't touch well, I'm not going to get the paint to transfer. What I've found is when doing things that have a little bit of texture to them, like this collage stuff, more mixed media things, paint really shows up nicely. It's strong and it's vibrant compared to using an ink pad. This was the goal, was to get this image onto this piece but I've still got plenty of paint left on that plate, so as long as everything's out, let's make some prints of this on plain old paper. By taking a second stamping of this before adding any more paint to it, I'm gonna get more of a ghost print or a lighter print to it. It's gonna give it a different vibe than when it's fully inked up. Because you've got a brayer that's got paint on it, you can also apply that directly onto the stamp by simply rolling it onto the stamp. The gel plate is acting as your palette there, where that's where you've spread the paint out, gotten a nice thin coat onto the brayer, which you then transfer over to the stamp. My one big issue with using a brayer this way, if I'm not using a gel plate, is a whole bunch of the paint gets spread out on the palette surface, but gets wasted. It doesn't really get used. And I don't like wasting paint like that. I really want to get full use out of all my tools and supplies. So that's why I'm using the gel plate over there as my palette, because all that black paint that's on there, it's not going to go to waste. And I'll show you. I'm going to plop the stamp on there so that I'm inking up the stamp. I'm basically transferring a bunch of that black paint onto that rubber stamp that I've carved. When I lift up the stamp to make a traditional print with it, to just stamp it right there on that white paper, really look at the plate because you've got a sneak peek of what's about to happen on the gel print that I'm going to take off of the plate. All that pattern there, there is wonderful goodness waiting for us there. But before I get to that, I got to finish up the stamped image over here. Nice, strong color there, simply because I was using paint with the stamp. But now, let's get to the gel print on there. I'm going to put the piece of paper on there. The reason why I'm rubbing my hands around here so much is because I want to make sure that I've got great contact between the paper and the gel plate. Because without that, the print doesn't really happen as well. As I lift this up, you get to see that reverse image, that wonderful ghost that's in there of that carved stamp. This is just one of the ways to use a gel plate to make prints that you love. In my workshop called Gel Printing Fundamentals, I cover lots and lots of ways to use a gel plate, including other ways to use them with stamps. So if you're ready to get the most out of your gel plate, to understand why it does what it does, and then create prints that you love on demand, then check out Gel Printing Fundamentals. You can find all the details over on the blog at acolorfuljourney.com. Thanks so much for joining me for today's play. I hope you've had as much fun as I have. If you've been enjoying this video, I'd so appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more of the fun, hit that subscribe button. That way you'll know as soon as I have a new video out. Thanks so much for letting me be a part of your colorful journey.